Good morning. I am Councilman Robert Stokes, Chairman of the Education, Youth, Workforce, and Youth Committee. Also joining today, committee members uh, Z Cohen from the Councilman Z Cohen from the First District. Sure. Uh, Councilwoman Felicia Porter from the Tenth District. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, also, Councilman uh, Bullock from the Ninth District, committee member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also, we have Kiss, K Councilman Christopher Burnett from the Eighth, Eighth District, who is the sponsor of this um, bill or resolution. Um, we also have James Torrance, committee member from the Seventh District. Um, we have Nikki Thompson from the City Council President's Office. We also have Nina Thimlis from the mayor's office and the committee staff person is Marguerite Kern. So I want to acknowledge that uh, Vice President Councilman Milton has excused absence today. Before I start, I'm asking all speakers and panelists to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Identify yourself before you speak Speak slowly and clearly, and after you finish speaking, please mute yourself again until you are asked to speak again. We are meeting today to discuss Council Resolution 21-0047R, upkeep and maintenance of vacant lots and public green spaces. I don't want to read that whole um, re recital, so I'm just going to say that um, uh, Council Burnett is the sponsor of this particular bill also. And I don't see the council president on here at all. Okay, also I want to recognize uh, committee member uh, Antonio Glover also from the 13th district. Uh, Councilman uh, Burnett is the primary um, sponsor of this bill. If he had, do you have any open remarks, Councilman? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair uh, and colleagues. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, so we can get right to it. But uh, essentially every year, I know all of us have the same sort of experience uh, with uh, mowing and, and navigating concerns with having uh, vacant lots or green spaces taken care of in a, a timely manner uh, in our districts. Um, there's also additional confusion sometimes as it relates to which, which agency is responsible for which lots. Uh, so some lots are Department of Housing responsibility, some are the Comptroller's Office, some are Reckon Parks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so with this resolution it is a continuation of the conversation that was initiated by Vice President Middleton uh, a few years back calling for the uh, consolidation of contracts. Uh, there, just, there being a single responsible agency, a single contract so that there is uh, no further confusion about who's responsible for what, who do we hold accountable for the timelines and to make sure that our city is clean and green. Uh, and so that is the, the intent of uh, reintroducing this is to, to continue to, to push for a, a central uh, agency, a central contract um, or, or the formation of some sort of work group uh, to be the, the, the primary responsible or organization or entity to, to manage this uh, ongoing concern. Um, with that, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for the opportunity to speak and looking forward to a good conversation today. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Before, as we start, I'm going to let City Administrator um, Christopher Short speak first. He has a previous appointment and he has to leave early. So, uh, City Administrator, uh, it's your floors belong to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, good morning, uh, Council members. Uh, I'm not sure if Council President Mosby is on the line, uh, but wanted to make sure that I provided appropriate greetings. Uh, I am Chris Shorter, City Administrator for the City of Baltimore. Appreciate very much uh, being able to join you this morning and offer testimony on the City Council Bill 21-0047R, Upkeep and Maintenance of Vacant Lots and Public Green Spaces. As you Can know, you, this, I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask you to talk about your report. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. You can proceed. Them. I apologize. Oh, it's no problem at all. And uh, let me ask uh, uh, Chairman, am I limited by a certain time frame or? 
No, no, no. Because I know you. I know you have to. Um, you have another point, so that's why I would let you move. Testify yes. for yes. that. Yes, sir. Um, this bill has uh, requested that the director of the Department of Rec and Parks, the Department of Planning, the Department of Transportation, our Department of Housing and Community Development, head of the Bureau of Solid Waste, and the Sustainability Coordinator. A representative from the Office of the Comptroller and the Chief of the Bureau of, Bud of Budget and Management Research report on the annual cumulative total of calls for service for the upkeep and maintenance of vacant lots and green spaces and recommends that the administration uh, take a single city agency and, and charge that agency with the responsibility of mowing all city owned properties, uh, lots, parcels, parks, and green spaces. In this testimony, I will highlight the ecosystem, if you will, of the agencies involved in grounds maintenance and give an overview of the ongoing work we are doing as a government to improve grounds maintenance operations citywide. Uh, as the city administrator, it is my mandate to facilitate interagency agency collaboration and enhance the operational efficiency and the programmatic effectiveness of city service. Uh, to that end, this administration is in support of any effort to improve how our city agencies mow and maintain vacant lots and a public green spaces. However, we also believe that a single agency being charged with that responsibility is not the appropriate course of action to improve how the city provides these services. There are five agencies that share the responsibility for mowing and maintaining vacant lots and public uh, lands throughout the city of Baltimore. Uh, these agencies, uh, as have been discussed, are the Department of Public Works, the Department of Transportation, our Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, the Department of General Services, and uh, the Department of Rec and Parks. Of these five agencies, BCRP, DPW, DGS, and DOT are responsible for deploying teams that execute the mowing and maintenance operations. Uh, the fifth agency, DHCD, is responsible for identifying via 311 service requests and proactive enforcement, the, the presence of property that needs uh, maintenance. The work orders produced by DHCD are then serviced uh, by DPW. The size of lots, types of facilities, frequency of service, and equipment and staffing needs are varied across agencies, uh, which would complicate uh, any effort, if you will, to consolidate city ground, citywide grounds maintenance services under one agency. DPW is responsible for the maintenance uh, and mowing of all DPW facilities and all city-owned vacant lots and privately owned uh, vacant lots. BCRP is responsible for the maintenance of over 2,900 acres of park property. DOT has the responsibility for all of the medians and soft shoulders throughout the city. And finally, DGS is responsible for the maintenance of 78 acres of land inclusive of both DGS properties and other agency properties such as surplus schools, multi-purpose centers, and mixed-use office spaces. This administration has already been coordinating agencies to address the issue of ground maintenance as part of the comprehensive performance reviews in clean staff. In clean staff meetings, we review agency performance in three primary uh, goal areas of property maintenance, street and alley cleaning, and waste and recycling removal. This review is comprehensive and includes measures such as workforce availability, supply availability, uh, service request response, and service equity. It is an opportunity to not only drive performance in these areas, but also improve data quality and collection in these domains and to explore new approaches. One element of clean staff that I would like to highlight is our use of inspections to audit our operation. The OPI, the OPI or Office of Performance and Innovation staff engage in in-person inspections to verify service quality and report back to the group. This requires staff to go on site uh, and um, are already receiving uh, cleaning landscaping, mowing services, and taking photos and videos uh, to use as live case studies that are 
then um, used as cases to improve service quality. In addition to CleanStep, over the last few months, I have uh, convened a separate working group that is specifically focused on doing a series of deep dives into our citywide ground maintenance activities. The purpose of this group is to target two specific areas of improvement, which are technology and procurement. Uh, the group is tasked with reviewing potential technology solutions that can be leveraged citywide and used by all agencies for assigning, monitoring, and reporting work, and to develop a procurement strategy to better leverage third-party vendors. As a part of our procurement review, we are evaluating the size and scope of the existing contracts and attempting to understand the impact of augmenting or our existing capacity through inclusive inclusion of more vendors, particularly minority and women-owned firms. We believe that the work of this group will enhance the quality, reliability, and predictability uh, of our citywide grounds maintenance operations once it is complete. Our vision for citywide grounds maintenance operations is that we would have predictability and visibility about what these operations and when they will occur. Uh, and verification and confirmation after they occur. Uh, we already have the ability to do some of this through systems such as CityWorks and CodeMap, but are evaluating how they complement our other systems. We also already have some quality assurance activities underway, but we are evaluating how to standardize uh, for internal and external teams. This will be no easy task, uh, and will require a new approach to how we procure and monitor these services. Uh, it will also require a significant shift in workforce training and the development uh, and deployment of technology, but we believe it is possible. Uh, I will say in closing, I would like to reiterate that there is already ongoing work to improve grounds maintenance. Uh, we are aware of some of the uh, issues and challenges uh, and have begun to address them with an eye towards improving service quality and reviewing our existing contracts and reimagining, if you will, our future solicitations, uh, requiring all mowing operations to be conducted by a single agency may have unintended consequences and undermine some of the ongoing, uh, ongoing activities. Uh, I'll stop there and certainly am available, uh, available for questions. Uh, thank you. I don't want to any of the council person any questions, but I'm going to start off with the sponsor of the bill, um, Councilman Burnett. If you have any questions for Mr. City Administrator Shore. I do. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, uh, City Administrator uh, Shorter, for joining us today uh, and for the, the uh, comprehensive response. Um, the first question uh, I had was, obviously, I understand that there's internal coordination happening to improve the response. <laughs> Uh, has there been a assessment done on the cost, potential cost savings of a single contract uh, for mowing for the city um, versus having each agency have a separate contract uh, for mowing services with, with you know, because a lot of this is outsourced. There are, I know that there are, is some work done in-house, for example, Wreck and Parks, I know handles. Uh, many of their uh, uh, properties in-house, but there are also contracts that contractors involved with their work, with the median work that DOT does, uh, with some of the work done by the Department of Housing, et cetera, DBW. Um, has there been a cost an analysis that would show that it's more cost effective uh, and efficient for the city to have multiple contracts? I appreciate that question uh, very much. Uh, I don't know that I've seen uh, a cost to benefit analysis uh, of that type as of as of yet. Uh, I will say I do I do have some concerns and just in working with the various teams and agencies that are doing this work for the city certainly know uh, that they would be able to articulate some concerns as well. Um, these parcels, many of them require different types of skills, different equipment, and in some cases, the same or similar contractor is already providing services to various city agencies, but having a single vendor 
uh, providing that service for the entire city puts us as a city at a, at a disadvantage in the sense that we would be fully dependent on one partner uh, to provide cutting and mowing services across the board versus us breaking up the work similar to the way that we do now, but even more so, so that smaller vendors uh, can, can do some of the work and we would not be in a situation as a city where we are completely reliant on one vendor. You are absolutely right, uh, Councilman, in that some of this work is being done in-house by our own maintenance and grounds crews, uh, and some of the work is being done by third parties. Uh, I don't know, just like I wouldn't want to, to see the city um, partner with only one vendor to provide a, a, such an important service, uh, whether it's uh, solid waste, recycling, composting. I also wouldn't want to see us um, as a city partner with one vendor to provide all grounds maintenance services. I'm not even sure that a single vendor has the capacity to, to do that kind of work uh, at, um, for, for, for our city. That said, I'm happy to go back to, to the team and, uh, and do some work uh, to figure out what the financial or cost to benefit would be uh, if uh, if a single vendor was doing this uh, doing this work. Got it. So there's a, a quick follow up on that. Um, well, my understanding though is that there are already subcontractors involved in many of these contracts anyway. So I mean, I, I don't see a scenario where even if there was one larger contract, that smaller contractors still wouldn't be involved to, to some extent as subs uh, on these because uh, I, I, my understanding is that, that that's already the case anyway on some of these contracts um, to, to I guess shift it a little bit away from single contractor uh, has there and that you, you sort of referred to it a little bit around this sort of um, group coordination um, I, I guess the other the question I would have around would be single agency responsible and there being some delineation of the work, uh, perhaps by region uh, or, or some other way to, to organize the, the contract management side. Has there, has there been any exploration there um, so that there is just one? And the reason I'm saying that is to give an example, uh, a few years back, we had a situation where Baltimore City Schools had a contract for uh, mowing their their spaces and and then rec and parks also has a contract and there are spaces that are contiguous where the lines between the school and the parks are right next to each other but they were on different mow schedules and so you'd have these situations where the school part of the school would you know a citizen would look at it and say well this looks like one green space half of it's overgrown because they're on a different schedule than the other agency and obviously city schools is sort of a different conversation so i don't really want to focus on that because obviously we wouldn't have control over that anyway but regardless of the fact there the lack of sort of there being any sort of all right this is the schedule we're doing this all at once it just seems very inefficient um to have uh so many things happening when you know even with you know I, I've, I've had situations where i've had a median on Edmondson Avenue get mowed by DOT, but the grass is overgrown literally on another city lot right next to the median because that's Department of Housing is working with DPW on an entirely different schedule. And so, of course, we get the calls from constituents saying, well, why didn't they finish the work? And we end up in a situation where it's like, well, it's not that it didn't finish, but there's different agencies. You know what I mean? Like I have to go down this rabbit hole of bureaucracy with folks when it, it obviously is something that if there's a crew coming out, they, there should just be this level of coordination that it's just all being done at once. Um, and which, you know, again, just is a, an efficient thing to do. Um, and one that I, I think is just, it just would make the city look better if we, you know, the, sort of, because it, it just sort of, when you, when you don't really understand the complexity of it all, it just seems like we're inept and the person forgot to do the other side of the street, you know, and it's just like, if we can't can even convey uh, to constituents that there's like a rhyme and reason for this or that there's, we just didn't simply forget or whatever, you know, things that they may come up with as to why that may occur, it just a much more That's professional operation question. would be. Um, so the question would be, uh, sorry, I, I, I editorialized it. The original That's question, right. I, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> the original question was, has there been exploration of a single agency being responsible? My, my apologies on that, Mr. Chair. Sure. 
Uh, definitely appreciate the the uh, uh, the comments, uh, Councilman, and and the question. Uh, yes, there has absolutely been a great deal of discussion um, around how the agencies manage and if it makes sense for us to uh, to to transfer some responsibility from one agency to the next. I will say that the core issue here. Uh, based on what you just said and what certainly what we uh, as a city are continuing to hear year after year is really an issue of coordination. And even in what the example you just used, Councilman, it is this is a challenge of coordination, not necessarily uh, a challenge of management. And so if we are properly um, organized, meaning that we are using and leveraging our information technology systems to not just uh, do the work, but to align and coordinate that work between agencies, then we know, we have the intelligence to know which agency is cutting which lot at what time during what week and at what frequency. Uh, and so my, what we are pushing for uh, as, a, as a team is making sure that we're able to do that quality assurance and quality control uh, in a standardized way across the board that individual agencies have their own systems of managing uh, the grounds maintenance effort, but that there is a single system for quality assurance and quality control <laughs> that we can all rely on and depend on. So that is the conversation around technology that we that we are having and that we're trying to solve for. The issue of procurement and how we are leveraging our contracts and our contractors and even managing those contractors is also a conversation that we are having uh, and we hope that by the end of this calendar year to have created a scenario where our procurement operation, our procurement strategy is better aligned so that, and, and like you said, Councilman, the schools is a different conversation, but for those agencies that, uh, that we are talking about and that report into our, to, to our executive, that those agencies are aligned and we do not have a situation where uh, one half of a lot or one median across the street from a lot are on different schedules. We, these are knowable operational activities. We just need the technology system to tell us. I wouldn't necessarily assume that it would be more efficient for one agency to manage. Uh, what I am uh, suggesting is that, uh, though, that the agencies involved just have to better, co better coordinate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have some follow-up, but uh, I know we, we're stuck to two, so I'll, uh, I'll hold off on the next round. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, I know I see uh, Councilman Torrance. I just have a suggestion for um, City Administrator Short. You, I'm sure you are aware of the adopt a lot program. When somebody adopted, they responsible for cutting and cleaning. They can't build on it because they had to go through vacancy value. I'm seeing that a lot of developers who have LDA land disposition agreements here in the city, until the development start, the city is still cutting and cleaning the grass. Why are we working to wasting resources? If you want to develop that property and you all is already in your LDA, the developer should still be responsible for cutting and cleaning just like a DAPA block program. Why are we now, because their development have not start, the city is still cutting clean in the grass. That's extra resources that we are spending for nothing. If you're going to adopt, if you're going to do the LDA, then part of the agreement is until your development start, you should be responsible for that property because you want to develop on it. So while we still got DPW and all these agencies cutting and cleaning the property that the, the developer has agreement with, with the LDA, that, with the city, to develop the property. I just want to kind of go back and look at that because that's what's happening all over the city. I can go to Greenmount and, and Biddle with um, Rebuild Metro. They're going, to, they're going to do some development there. But I got to call Ms. Moore and her staff who do a great job to cut the grass. But it's in Johnson Square's LDA. So if it's in their LDA, why can't we now put that in their LDA that until your development starts? You should be responsible for cutting and cleaning because the same thing they do if you adopt the block, except you can't build on it. So that was just a suggestion I wanted to kind of um, throw out there to you. And if you're going back and looking at re, re changing things, maybe we need to look at that and work through that with housing. So, thank you, sir. 
I, I'll, uh, I'll start. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, I don't know if Jason uh, or housing would like to address when they address uh, that. I appreciate very much the suggestion uh, when they speak. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilman Torrance, who had his hand raised uh, from the seventh district. Before you start, uh, Councilman, let me acknowledge Andy Frank from um, the City Controller's Office, Bill Henry's office, and also um, Matt Stegman from President um, Mosby's office. So also, uh, Councilman, you can proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon. Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Mr. Short, I have two questions. One's related to procurement, and then the other is related to improvement science. So we have taken the information from 311, correct? So I can tell you by looking at 311 reports that there are lots that we just know historically that are going to be ones that are going to be overgrown. Are we proactively pulling those reports prior to cut before the spring? and proactively looking to cut them is the question. It's for me. Um, and how do we improve upon that? And how do we schedule lots that we know from the previous year that were overgrown that we continually had to cut? So I just want to make sure that we are figuring out where we where we have new lots that are added, where we have lots that historically need to be cut all the time, and how are we using that to do schedules with not only our contractors, but also our in-house staff. I just want to make that portion. And then for my second question, because my my reception is crazy. My second question is related to procurement. Why are we, do we have a centralized way where we send out one solicitation so that we get all of the possible vendors agreeing to terms for two to three years at the same cost so that if John Moen Company is getting $300 per cut, they're getting $300 per cut no matter the agency. That way, because what I've seen it's on the procurement contracts is that the cost in the actual services are different. So like there would be $1,200 here, 15 here or 12 here. So it's just like, how do we have a standard, how would you say a standard rate for our vendors across agencies to make sure that we are estimating what our costs are? Those are my two questions, sorry. Thank you, Councilman. I do wanna call on housing to answer the question, the, your initial question about how we prepare our schedules for this, our cutting schedules for the season, and if uh, if vacant lots, traditional uh, vacant lots, uh, are in, uh, incorporated in our in our in our schedules at the start of the season. In terms of procurement, um, uh, our contracts are multi-year. Um, I don't believe any of our cutting contracts are single-year contracts. They are generally multi-year with option years. Uh, because every agency is cutting uh, uh, different parcels, I wouldn't, for example, s suggest that the per hour rate for a contractor cutting a median that requires an attenuator and requires all kinds of other safety measures should be charging the same per hour rate as a contractor that is cutting a lot um, without as much uh, risk. Um, so we we are working with our vendor community to make sure that we are properly pricing and properly scoping the service, uh, but that service does look different uh, by agency, uh, and in some cases even within the agency. Um, so wanted to make sure I made that point. Um, but housing, did you, Jason? Did you want to uh, jump in on how we prepare for the season in terms of our cutting schedule? Uh, yeah, I can uh, respond to that. Um, so we do not uh, have a set schedule at this time for properties. So uh, DHCD is responsible for um, responding to 311 complaints, but also reinspecting properties that have existing violation notices and um, patrolling areas where we know that there are going to be the need for cutting and cleaning and may not get the uh, same level of 311 complaints. And so housing inspectors um, are, are prepped and ready to go in late February, early March, um, potentially here in Maryland where the season could start. Um, sometimes it gets pushed to like April or, or even May, but um, depending on weather. But the, the housing inspectors are ready and they're out, they're looking for those things. And really for us, the season never ends because it's a cleaning and cutting situation. And so we're always looking for, for that kind of stuff. Um, even December, January, February, it, it, 
more of a cleaning issue and not a cutting issue, but we're still out there looking for it, proactively putting it in. But we create the work orders to have public works teams um, cut the vacant lots, cut the vacant um, buildings um, that are abandoned um, and clean up those areas. Um, we'll also put in for dirty alley and dirty streets um, so that those can be dealt with proactively. Um, but there isn't a, a set schedule. We're just kind of patrolling and looking because it it changes constantly uh, as a property gets developed or a lot gets um, adopted or something of that nature. Those fall off and others come on. Um, some areas don't need a lot of cutting, but may need to be cleaned more regularly. Um, so it, you, there were a couple of seasons where we did try to do uh, with DPW had a proactive mowing program, um, but it, it quickly trying to hit all the lots on a schedule quickly overwhelmed the resources available. Um, and we weren't getting to the things that were being complained about um, very quickly. I don't know if Marsha or DPW has anything else to add. So any is that your answer is that good, good answer for you, um Councilman Torrance? Is it, I know that was um, um, Mr. Chair, not really. Oh, um, okay. Do you have the second I question? Need. Yeah, so like the specifics I need for like why we don't have a schedule. And this goes back to that question about capacity and how do we proactively looking at things that we can do with our vendor capacity, correct? And so like it's troubling because we have the data. We know the lots. We know that the seasons may change. We know when people are adopting lots. How are we working internally to improve that process, to clean the data, to make the appropriate thing? This goes back to that clean stack question. I think that one of the things I think I need from the agencies is a follow-up in terms of like, what are the, for your clean stack, what are the, the, the data points that you're looking at? How are you proactively doing it? Because at a point, it, I, and, I, and I struggle with this because with a lot of our agencies, it's more reactionary, not proactive. And I think those. I think we'll, when we go into this next funding cycle, in terms of going into agency funding, it's important to know that what the capacity is with proactive things and where we can react, so that we can start thinking about how we shift funding to make sure that we can do this better, and how do we make sure we have the appropriate staff to do it better. And I just, I just. I just want us to think from an improvement science perspective that like some of the things that we have internally among the agencies may not be the best operationally. But my other question, hey, let me go back to where, um, for procurement. That, that wasn't like, your second question, Councilman? <laughs> no, no, it was not my second question. Um, uh, can we, can, before we start, can we at least stay with the questions and kind of save the speeches for Bit. No, no, no. I'm just, no, Mr. Okay. Chair, I'm making requests because I asked my two questions, but I don't think the answers were sufficient to be respectful. Okay. All right. So what I want to know is what the data points are for that. And then the other question that I, and the other request I would like to know is currently what are the current rates by agencies for our vendors? So I can see it across the board and what the requirements are for those contracts. Because given my procurement background, there are ways that we can create some financial efficiencies as well. I just want to make those requests. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, is that for the city administrator or that for just us? We're, we're happy uh, to, to work to provide that information. So one councilman uh, information on uh, the clean stat um, um, the indicators and key uh, performance reviews that are being done during clean stat, and then the other is rates that we are that we are uh, paying for uh, for our con uh, across the board for our contracts. Happy to provide uh, that kind of information. Thank you, sir. Um, Councilman, I'm sorry, Mr. This is this is kind of sort of like uh, some comments towards like. Uh, uh, Mr. Shorter or just any of the other agencies that are on here, <clears throat> I would like to see that, um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Chair, 
and thank everyone for for attending this hearing today. Um, I think one of the things that, that is missing, and the reason why I said because me being a former employee of uh, EPW and solid waste uh, for over 16 years, is the lack of communication between agencies. Um, I think we can really um, probably put a dent into getting things um, fixed, work mode, whatever issues that we have, and there was a better lack of communication between uh, between those agencies. For instance, if you know solid waste was to come out and just say, for instance, clean the yard, um, or if housing was to come out to assess the property and the work wasn't with housing, what happens is that a lot of times it'll be put in a system as if it's you know TCO taken care of instead of or it'll be closed out instead of us saying in the in inside of 311 that it was moved to another agency i think that would help us out a lot and then moving forward i think as council people i think as the community when we do go into look and see where's the status of our 311 complaint is we'll know from that point on okay we ever have this issue again there's no need to call dpw solid waste or housing it's strictly to call wherever that vendor decided to send that issue to, we know moving forward, that's what we deal with. So I think it's, I think it's a lack of communication, a lack of education, educating the public on exactly what agency does what. And I think if we kind of focus on those issues, excuse me, on those uh, agencies, on what jobs they are to do, it help us out as council people, and also it'll help the community in reference to when they want to call 301 in reference to a complaint they know exactly what agency to uh reference their complaint to that's all really i had to say it just uh basically about you know other agencies communicating with each other in order for us to uh tackle these issues that are brought to us by uh our constituents uh, thank you councilman uh councilwoman porter Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I won't um, belabor the point regarding the coordination of agencies. I think that um, CAO Shorter um, talked about some of the ways that the administration is working um, to kind of coordinate these efforts um, between agencies or maybe transitioning to one to two um, coordinating agencies. My, um, my question, my follow-up question to that, what is the timeline for execution from those particular work groups or any type of recommendations from those work groups? Because, you know, as many of the council members just mentioned, when we're talking to constituents, they just want to see that the, the area is clean, the area is mowed. And I just want to highlight that when we, you know, when we don't mow, you know, typically high grass areas, there are other subsequent um, sanitation issues issues that ensue because of that rats rodents all of the things that you know we're, we're trying we're trying to address and so um, CAO shorter if you could share um, a timeline regarding any type of um, short-term intermediate or long-term benchmarks that the work group has developed um, with regard to a timeline for for kind of like the coordination for these issues thank you councilwoman I appreciate the question and appreciate the 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 comments uh, pre before the question. Uh, let me say first that we, that all of the contracts that agencies are currently using to provide grounds maintenance, I believe are still current. Uh, so we are not going into a situation in the next season where we are rebidding contracts uh, because the contracts are, um, are expired. That said, we may be letting new contracts based on the conversations and work that's happening right now. That would, in my mind, need to be done by the end of this calendar year for us to safely um, partner uh, with vendors and provide the, the right inventory of properties by the next cutting season. So by the end of December this year, any changes we plan to make uh, in terms of our vendor management structure and how we procure for third party support has to be done before the end of December. Uh, in terms of IT and information technology improvements, uh, if we are going to stand up a quality assurance and quality control system that is across the board, uh, that, that work also has to be done in my mind before the end of the calendar year so that we are practiced 
and we have an opportunity to train our workforce on that system. Thank you so much, um, CAO Shorter. Mr. Chair, um, can I recommend that we um, we add that as a follow-up action item to follow up at the end of this year to follow up on the progress of that particular sure. um, that particular recommendation? My, my second question actually has to deal with the intersection of city-owned properties and commercial, I'm sorry, privately owned um, privately owned land. Like that's a major issue in um, across the city whereby, um, city owned lots versus privately owned parcels of land not you know not mowing the grass can you all speak to the intersection of how you all are enforcing that privately owned um, operators are maintaining their properties on a consistent basis and not using city not using um, relevant city funds to to handle like their their issues of mowing, et cetera. And if we are handling those issues, can you speak to the process and timeline on how we are recouping those funds back to the city coffers? Thank you. I want to invite uh, Jason to, to respond uh, if, if appropriate on behalf of Sure. Um, enforcement um, and collection is really broken up uh, between the occupied properties and unoccupied properties. So uh, the main tool for enforcement on an occupied property where an owner just isn't maintaining it up to um, normal um, neighborhood standards and to the code uh, is generally through citation. And that in a residential area is usually a $50 citation. Um, they have the ability to request a hearing. Um, they have to pay the citation, failure to um, pay the citation and correct the issue, um, the citation becomes a, a lien on the property. It, it ultimately triples. Um, so for properties where it's just keeping up with the community standards and, and not letting things slip, the citation is the main tool. Um, dealing with vacant lots, vacant buildings, um, in most of those cases, citations aren't going to work because there is not um, you know, an arm to twist. Uh, the owners okay. may be deceased or a defunct corporation or something of that nature. Um, so we usually will have a, a violation notice on those, either a vacant building notice or an exterior sanitation notice on the property. We will have conducted research into who the owner is and where they actually might be, especially if it's a vacant house or a vacant lot, um, to try and get that notice actually to them because, you know, sending it to the vacant lot doesn't help. Um, <clears throat> the inspectors will attempt to make contact, um, but the maintenance of it, if they fail to take care of it, it, it ends up falling on the city to do it. Um, that's where the inspectors will create the work orders to have um, public works cut um, and clean the lots. Um, and we had years ago worked with public works to um, uh, automate the process so that when they close out a work order, um, they're billing an appropriate amount to cover the city's cost on that property. Um, and so that is uh, all automated and it goes to FISC Finance and they will issue a bill and create a lien on the property. Um, and they do recover um, costs every year um, on those properties, either when the property goes to tax sale or if the property, um, if the owner sells or tries to refinance or something of that nature. Um, you know, they will recruit some of those funds, obviously not all of them, because there's a, a significant portion of vacant buildings um, that are truly abandoned. There is no owner to pay, um, and there is not a market currently um, for that uh, vacant building or vacant lot um, to transfer it to someone who may rehab the building or rebuild or, or use it in some other way. Um, so the agency, through our community development side working to address some of those issues um, but that, that's how the enforcement piece works and how we recoup some of the funds thank you so much um sorry that's my dog he see, hears somebody at the door <laughs> um uh mr hessler i'll definitely follow up with you um regarding specific data points um that i'm looking for related to the length of time um regarding um, the citations on these particular buildings, um, the citations, fines accrued from those buildings and the also actual data point amount. Um, sorry, Bruno, 
sorry, <laughs> the actual um, funds recouped from um, from that as well. But thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, uh, City Administrator. You got a little more time because we have um, Councilman Cohen, and then our next question is going to come from the response to the bill, um, Councilman Burnett. Sure, of course, of course. And real quick, Councilman Cohen, before you start, um, once um, uh, City Administrator leave, uh, Ariel Giles will be representing the City Administrator after the City Administrator leave this meeting. So there will be somebody on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Um, City Administrator Shorter and all the agency staff that are present. Um, I want to put a fine point and a question on Member Burnett's sort of premise around just inefficiency of having five separate agencies, five separate contracts, which, again, is something that we see play out almost every day um, when folks ask us why one site got mowed, the other did not. When is the mowing coming? When are the parks going to get mowed? And so on. Um, you've been an administrator in multiple cities. Is that a common practice? And I know there is this work group studying it, but is there a world in which we reduce the amount of agencies that have separate contracts? Because it just intuitively seems inefficient the way we're doing it. And I'm curious, because I know there are some cities that don't have five separate contracts, what you've seen around the country and what's best practice. Uh, I, I thank you very much for that question, Councilman. I um, have done my best not to assume uh, just because I've been in other cities uh, and seen, you know, seen grounds maintenance operations in other cities that I know what's best for Baltimore, which is why we're talking to staff and the leaders who know the city best. Um, I will say I have not in the cities that I've served in seen a scenario where, for example, rec in parks is not responsible for cutting parks or where general services is not responsible for cutting government buildings uh, and lots around government buildings or where housing uh, is not responsible for at least identifying uh, where cuts uh, need to need to take place even if there's a third party providing the service uh, it and so to answer your question i i haven't I haven't seen it done that way, um, which is why you know the pre my predisposition is not to assume that it would be more efficient uh, or more effective managed under one large agency, and that agency would need to be large. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of parcels and properties with very complex responsibilities, uh, and agency owners currently know their portfolio and they know it well. Uh, to subsume that responsibility under one agency where that agency may not know parks, they may not know housing, they may not know uh, uh, our government buildings as well, for example, as DGS, uh, would be assuming a lot. And so um, what, what we have really tried to work towards in terms of problem solving is what the root cause is. And the root cause in my mind right now is lack of proper coordination uh, and lack of information and information being um, monitoring, reporting and ensuring quality service. Uh, and in that way, we have uh, we as a city uh, can do can do much better in the way of making sure that agencies are working together uh, and leveraging technology systems to make sure that we are allowing for it. Um, and so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it does. I just wonder whether, you know, in terms of that larger entity that could oversee, like part of that is, you know, maybe your office um, I have the long view um, because, again, it, it just feels like there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen and I don't know whether it's to consolidate from five to three or something but again it just feels like there's a lot of movement and confusion like we see in a lot of different scenarios with 311s that 
go this way, but we're actually supposed to go that way. I, I mean, there's a lot of like disentangling that I think we as council people end up having to do. Um, and so, I, I, again, I know you're working on it through this work group. I know you're trying to identify the root cause and where you could get better efficiencies, but it, it, it just feels currently like there's a lot of confusion and often work is um, delayed, not done, and then falls on us um, as council people. Um, so, you know, we would just throw that out there that I think keeping the option on the table of is there some kind of consolidation that could happen in a different system of monitoring um, to, to me seems seems important. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Shorter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, you comment? Um, I was just acknowledging, uh, acknowledging, and wanted to thank him for uh, for for that. And it absolutely is still on the table. Uh, we have not taken anything off the table in terms of uh, even smaller consolidations versus uh, a large scale consolidation. So again, thank you for thank you for the feedback, Council. Thank you. And our last um, uh, question is about the response that Council Bennett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just a quick question. Am I coming through? Is my internet okay? Okay. Um, the the follow up I had, uh, Mr. Administrator, um, you mentioned uh, quality control. Uh, one of the uh, issues I know we've we've dealt with is where contractors may go out um, and do work that's inadequate or leave you know, grass clippings and other debris on a sidewalk, that kind of thing. Uh, does each agency uh, or each agent is, is each agency required to uh, send staff to follow up or audit a, a certain percentage of the work being done by contractors on these lots? Thank you for that question, Councilman. And I want to invite other agencies to certainly uh, to jump in here. Uh, because I don't want to misrepresent the work based on what I am learning uh, from our discussions and certainly from city set is that many of our contracts uh, within the contract is a requirement that the contractor take photos and upload those photos uh, for the agency to review. Uh, what we are also learning from the city stat team going out and uh, inspecting these properties is that the photos uh, and the reports in the system don't always align with the reality of what's actually happening in, in these lots. And so, uh, what we are what we are talking through is what a quality assurance and quality control system that we manage, where we are actually um, inspecting the work that the contractors contractors and vendors are saying that they're doing, may be a better approach as we move forward. It will require more people and it will require more time, uh, but a, a, an, a comprehensive quality assurance and quality control system that is across the, that is across the city, regardless of the agency, um, I think will be responsive to many of your concerns uh, without necessarily taking the responsibility away from the agency that has the expertise. Um, got it. Okay. Um, the second question I had uh, for this round um, was the, uh, the, and I think we've had this conversation before, but to, now that we have other agencies here, um, is there conversation happening around all of the agencies operating on a proactive mowing schedule? Uh, and and I asked that just to give a, a quick level of context there are some agencies that are mowing the lot mowing lots as they are complained about um so if there's a three-on-one call then they proceed but otherwise there is no scheduled mowing uh other agencies uh do have proactive mowing uh is there conversation about having that be the standard across the board and and, and my concern is 
to Councilmember Porter's uh, point around the other issues that can arise uh, as it relates to um, other, you know, rodents, rats, trash, illegal dumping, it becomes sort of an equity issue in which communities that are more proactive um, and reporting things are likely to receive services that a community that may not know that they need to call through one uh, or may not have the bandwidth to do so um, just aren't being reported. And so these lots language lang languish year after year until literally someone complains about it, uh, which I, I think is, to be frank, a little bit unacceptable uh, when this, these are city lots we're talking about. Yes, sir. Uh, um, in most cases, uh, starting the cutting season off with clear schedules uh, where we know the properties that we are that we need to cut, we know the parks that we need to cut, we know the medians that we need to cut is is quite clear. Um, and our agencies are able to establish those schedules and agree with our vendors on the frequency of cuts. Uh, we do, and I believe housing is probably the best example of this, have uh, situations where we don't know um, where uh, through the cutting season there may be a need for additional cuts. There may be a need for additional work. Uh, and so the partnership between housing and DPW is not one that we can, where we can fully anticipate uh, the work effort or workload. Uh, so that said, I think the answer to your question, Councilman, is yes. Uh, we have to do a better job at the start of the season, uh, proactively identifying all of the properties that are uh, that are in our individual portfolios as agencies, uh, making sure that we're, we're, there's a vendor relationship, the vendor uh, has those schedules and has agreed to the cuts and frequency, uh, and then where there is not an ability for us to predict how we rotate uh, and, um, and get those properties into our system for cuts is something that we have to work towards in a much better way uh, as we approach the next cutting season. I hope that answers your question. Um, kind of. Um, I mean, I, I think. I mean, that was it. Actually, led to the a, the committee request I had, uh, Mr. Chair, for uh, information. Um, I was hoping we could submit a request for each of the agencies responsible for mowing, if they could provide the council with how many lots citywide they're responsible for. Uh, so I was, you know. Comptroller's office has a certain amount. The ACD has a certain amount. I think it would be helpful for us to have a, an idea of how many each are how many are each each, each have in their portfolio. I think would be helpful information for us, Mr. Okay, Chair. That's been noted. Thank you, um, Administrator Shoulder. Thank you for your time and staying and asking questions about admitting them to the council people. Um, you can be excused, but again, Ariel Giles will represent the city administrator. Once so you can excuse from the hill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So, um, we're going to go to uh, many reports, and our first one is from the mother. Any favor with any comments? Who's here from the mother? Mr. Victor? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, no, uh, this is uh, Victor Avola from the City Law Department. Uh, good morning. Um, the Law Department will stand by its report uh, and will approve the bill for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you. Department planning in favor of comments, and we have Director Chris Ryan. Uh, I, uh, this is Kim Knox, the greeting coordinator for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we stand by our report um, in terms of uh, uh, recommending disapproval of the of the bill. Thank you. And it's not your whole idea. You defer it to Department of Planning also. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Department of Transportation proposes uh, Liam Davis and Tavon Braxton. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Liam Davis, uh, Baltimore City DOT. Thank you for, for having us. Also joined by our Deputy Director, Tavon Braxton, and we also have our uh, su General Superintendent for Maintenance Division, Kendall abu -Akim. He might need to be elevated uh, to a panelist should a question come up. 
we do stand by our bill report at DOT, which is, um, you know, we're happy to have the conversation, but we are opposed to, uh, of any idea of essentially consolidating mowing operations. Um, you know, and I will say it's, it's really beyond mowing. Uh, a lot of times it's more vegetation management. Um, we deal with a lot more than just mowing. And I think our concern is some of the agencies have specialized, you know, um, responsibilities. Uh, for us, it's, it's really kind of maintaining the 2000 miles of right of way uh, that, that we are tasked with um, maintaining. Uh, to, to Councilman Burnett's question about the specific uh, locations, I can confirm um, DOT has over 500 locations, green uh, locations that we are in charge of mowing uh, or vegetation management for uh, of those, uh, or excuse me, 474 locations of those, uh, or excuse me, over 500 474 are contracted out, 74 are uh, handled internally by our um, landscaping maintenance section. So just want to throw that out there. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, DACD, I don't know if Stephanie heard that. Do you want to talk about it before? Hi, yes, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Stephanie Murdoch, Legislative Liaison for DHCD. Acting Commissioner Kennedy sends her regrets that she was unable to join today. And as you can see, we're also joined by Deputy Commissioner Jason Hessler. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to participate in this important discussion. And while we do not directly provide maintenance and mowing services, we do work closely with the Department of Public Works to route work orders to the agency for cleaning. I don't want to belabor some of the items that we spoke about earlier in the hearing that arose through questions, but I will briefly describe DHCD's role in the upkeep and maintenance of city-owned vacant lots, privately owned vacant lots, and city-owned lots that are a part of the Adopt-A-Lot program. As you heard, DHCD's Code Enforcement Division either responds to 311 calls for service or during routine inspections, and they're in charge with identifying these properties that need the maintenance attention and referring them to the appropriate agency. DHCD's Code Enforcement Division averages over 200,000 property maintenance code enforcement inspections per year and respond to most of them within three days. We complete 99% of our code enforcement service requests on time. For privately owned vacant lots, DHCD inspectors use code enforcement tools to hold property owners accountable for the vacant lots that, and for the, the maintenance and upkeep of vacant not lots. As Jason mentioned, sometimes there is not an arm to twist in this situation, but our first uh, effort is always going to try to be through the issuance of notice of citations to hold that property owner responsible. Um, if code enforcement efforts fail, to get the desired result, we can submit work orders to DPW to clean and lean the property. And sometimes these unpaid liens can lead these vacant properties to tax sale. And then finally, DHCD's adopt a lot program allows residents and businesses and neighborhood groups to steward and care for city owned vacant lots. An adopt a lot license holder can create community spaces that include gardens, clean and green spaces and recreational areas. The maintenance of the adopted lots is the responsibility of the entity that enters into the agreement. DHCD really relies on these partnerships, not only to reduce the burden on the city, but to, main, to help improve living conditions in neighborhoods. And since 2017, 426 lots have been adopted through the program. Uh, we are, as an agency, committed to working with various partners to enhance and expand efforts to maintain vacant lots in public green spaces. But it should be noted, um, as noted by brother and sister agencies, that this mowing work is specialized to the needs of each agency, and it would be difficult to coordinate agency needs, workflows, and timelines into one centralized uh, system capable of managing that wide variety of sites within the public and private realm. How, so, therefore, we're going to stand by our bill report and recommend disapproval. Uh, there were some questions that we could try to address. One was Councilman Stokes about the land, uh, land LDA agreements 
Um, that's a question that I think we're going to have to circle back on the particulars of what's involved in each agreement. So I will uh, follow up with you about that after the hearing. And then just one thing I wanted to note is that our inspectors are going out to visit uh, vacant buildings and lots um, on a schedule every 30, 60 or 90 days. So when conditions are uh, seen that warrant uh, a cutting or a cleaning, that's when they're going to put their work orders in. But we certainly look forward to working with uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, with uh, Mr. Shorter and uh, partner agencies to improve the process. So Jason and I stand by to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Department of Recreations on, on Fable. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm Jenny Morgan from Baltimore City Recreation and Parks. Uh, BCRP stands by our report that we would not be in favor of a single citywide contract um, based on several issues, including contract administration, quality controls, differences in contract specifications from one agency to another. And um, one item in particularly that we would have issue with is the inability of um, small businesses to um, have access to the contract and being able to foster those businesses so that they could respond to future awards. Um, we're happy to work with Administrator Shorter and the council and can respond to any questions that you might have. But BCRP does oppose this legislation. Um, thank you, Department of Public Works. I guess it's Marsha Collins, or if she's not at Ariel Giles. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Marsha Collins representing the Department of Public Works. We also have with us today Acting uh, Bureau Head Yvonne Moore Jackson. Uh, I just want to make a couple of quick statements. I, I appreciated the introductory and thorough remarks of. Uh, Chief Administrator Officer Shorter. It was very helpful to uh, provide the context of what the administration has been doing in regard to this deep concern that the City Council has. Uh, I will say as an agency that receives upwards of 4,000 requests for mowing a month, um, we have some of the most varied uh, challenges uh, for mowing. Uh, of all agencies, we believe we do not have a set number of lots that we may be responsible for in any one year. Uh, and we do have to work closely with our partners at DHCD. And I, I wanted to thank both Stephanie and uh, also uh, Jason for their uh, earlier remarks. Um, we have um, both the mayor and city council lots that are HCD and solid waste lots. We get the referrals from HCD for uh, vacant and abandoned properties and a non-responsive owners. Um, what we do within our own organization is we uh, look at every lot and we sort it and rate it as either a one being either small or fairly clean to two, to moderate size, or some cleaning necessary, to three, which is major cleaning. So our, our referrals tend to be areas which are also subject to some illegal dumping or to litter and trash collecting at these locations. So it's just not a matter of pulling out a mower or a weed whacker. We're also uh, challenged with um, the amount of debris that has to be cleared before we can even get to the mowing or as Liam points out, vegetation management. Uh, so we, we as our crews take on the most difficult cleaning jobs of the lots. Uh, the contracts that we have with outside vendors, um, they're not equipped to handle uh, the heavy cleaning workload. And so we take those on on ourselves. Um, just as a, a point of, of reference, uh, in uh, fiscal year 2021, uh, we received uh, 7, 17,825 high grass and weed requests and another 8,994 cleaning and high grass and weed requests. And there are other cleaning requests that do come in that may not be reflected in uh, the 311 request, but do require mowing as well. Uh, so there is a lot of work we have to do out there. Um, and I know there are challenges. Uh, we do send our supervisors out to inspect the work that's being done on a routine basis. 
Um, and uh, if we have to call people back, we have to call people back. Um, I'll leave our remarks there and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Department of Finance. Uh, Hi. Hi, this is Bob Senemi, Budget Director from the Department of Finance. Um, you know, first want to just uh, uh, echo some of the, the comments that we've heard from other agencies. Um, our bill report summarizes um, each of the functions in, in each of those agencies. And so, you know, we don't have to go into a, a lot of detail there. But, you know, to summarize, from our perspective, we are aware that this has come up. This did come up in the budget hearings this year, especially uh, at the end. Um, in our discussions with the agencies, we do agree that there are um, different requirements in each of the agencies. Um, you know, as an example, Rec and Parks with more of a pure, you know, mowing function, uh, DPW having sometimes that cleaning requirement on, on top of the mowing, and then DOT, uh, as it was described, more of like a landscaping or, or vegetation management function as well. So there are um, different requirements, and so uh, we do think there is um you know reason to believe that having separate agencies do this might be the best uh process uh having said that we do agree with the, the comments that the city administrator uh mentioned at the beginning that we should be looking from you know a technological potential improvements or or better procurement strategy um i can't say that we have done a a detailed financial analysis like what was requested earlier i believe from councilman burnett but we we will commit to do that across this whole um you know this whole um area of spend in our budget i suspect that um you know as the city administrator said we believe that you know having everything with one vendor does produce some risk for the city that uh, you know, having all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, could cause some some problems. Uh, having said that, there might be opportunities for just economies of scale if we have, you know, if we can merge a couple of the contracts together and see if we can get a better per price, uh, you know, per unit uh, price for some of these services. We also will look at um, the idea of doing some of this in-house versus contract. We know that it's kind of a mixed bag in in most agencies. Uh, there might be reason to believe that we should insource or outsource some of this uh, work. And so we will, as part of that working group, uh, uh, take care of that analysis and, and participate in that. So uh, with that, uh, happy to take any other questions from, from members of the committee. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Ms. Kern, are there any, is there any public testimony? Oh, I'm sorry. Control, I just missed you. I'm sorry. Controller's office, Andy Frank. Apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Good morning. I'm Andy Frank, Acting Real Estate Director in the Comptroller's Office. We stand by our bill report. Uh, by way of background, the Department of Real Estate is responsible for 1,300 owned lots, and we work with the Department of Public Works for mowing needs and with Recreation Park for service needs. We are not funded to sufficiently address the greening needs of these properties, but we support the resolution's oh. intent to bring greater centrality to the ground maintenance process, and I'm available to answer questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Frank. Appreciate it um, from the controller's office. We will take public testimony. For those who sign in using the computer, please use the raise hand function to indicate you wish to testify. We'll start with you. Now we go through the users who, who called into the hearing. Attendees who call cannot be identified by name, will be unmuted by committee staff one by one. You will hear two beeps when you're unmuted. If you wish to testify, please state your name at the beginning of your testimony. If a caller does not want to provide testimony, then simply they need to say they do not want to provide testimony after the two weeks. If any speaker is audible, they will be directly called back. Um, Ms. Kern, do we have any public testimony? Mr. Chair, at the moment, there's no raise hands. So I'm going to go into I'm going to go to the call in user. We have one call in user and you're unmuted if you would like to say something. Hello. Okay, Mr. Chair, there are no uh, there's no public testimony. That concludes the public testimony. 
Uh, Councilman Burnett, do you have any closing remarks that you would like to say? And uh, I want to know if you want to recess or take a vote on this. Um, so I was hoping we could recess since there's some okay. outstanding questions and information requests that have been sent by the committee um, for us to follow up on. And I know I had a couple uh, as well that I, I just planned to email, but I'll obviously CC the committee on as well. Um, so I, I think we should come back to the table once we kind of have an idea of the cost efficiencies that finance is going to be looking at and a little bit more on the coordination effort that the city administrator re referenced, if that's okay with you. Um, other than that, I didn't, I didn't have any, any other commentary at this point. I think uh, a lot of really important issues have been raised um, by the council. Uh, we've received some good feedback on those points from the agency side, but I, I think it would be helpful for us to continue the conversation uh, once we, the, the information requests uh, have been completed and we can come back to the table. Okay, before we recess, do any committee council members have any questions or comments before we recess this hearing? Okay, well, this hearing has been recessed. Thank everybody for being on the call and thank all the city agents for being on the call. So thank you. Everybody have a nice day.